Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our God, our wisdom, our salvation. Amen. Signs. Signs are something that we live by every single day. And in fact, we're so used to signs, we not necessarily notice signs. I can remember when I was in college, uh, and of course, uh, every college has a bulletin board, and of course, this were the days before computers and emails, so if you wanted to get your news on what was happening at the campus, you had to look at one of the billboards. But the one thing we discovered, the one thing that everybody discovered, was that after a while, you don't see the signs. You're so used to the billboard, and something gets posted, something's happening at the college, and nobody notices, right? So I can remember one year when I was uh, in charge of the chapel committee, it was a Christian liberals, liberal arts college I went to, when I was in charge of the chapel committee, we had, a, we had a speaker coming, and we really wanted to publicize it, but I knew if we just stuck it on the bulletin boards around the campus, the news wouldn't get out. So one day, Late in the day, I went around to the various buildings and I had, I had the announcements cut out in circles and I taped them all to the classroom clocks. Because, I, you know, when you're a student and it gets to be about five minutes before class is over, you know what happens, right? The books start to close, you put the notes away and you're just waiting for the professor. I had a professor in college who... No one ever did that because when students did that, he had the habit of looking back at his students and saying, time will pass, will you? <laughs> but we stuck them all over the clocks, uh, made some students kind of unhappy, but guess what? Everybody knew what was coming. So signs. We all have signs. We're driving. We see signs all the time, don't we? Stop, one way, yield, speed limit. Some people don't pay attention to those signs, but they're there, and they're there for good reason. Some signs are good. Some signs are warning signs. Our body sometimes tells us things, symptoms that we need to listen to. Of course, we have to be careful because in, these day, in the days of internet and all kinds of websites, we can have some symptoms and go on the web to self-diagnose, and before we knew it, know it, we're sure we have some rare fatal disease. And then we go to the doctor, and actually, whatever it is, it's really treatable. <laughs> but our body talks to us, gives us signs. I remember when we were waiting our first grandchild and the first time I saw our daughter and I could see a little bit of, you know, baby bump there, it was a sign. <laughs> we're going to be grandparents. And so signs are important. In the season of Lent, our theme for this season is rending our hearts, claiming the promise. Lent is a time when we rend our hearts, when we reflect upon our lives. We certainly receive the things about our lives that are pleasing to God, but this is the time to think about where we've fallen short, where we need to be more faithful. And notice the title of the series is, uh, in Lent is Rend Our Hearts. This is a corporate thing. It's not just individual. Yeah, it is individual. We all have to, to do that self-examination, but we have to do that as a church. You know, there's a reason why we have a prayer of confession every Sunday. Because it's not just enough for me or for you to confess our individual sins. That's important. But we have to confess our sins together. The sins of the church. 
And I think that's important because there's not enough confession today in the Western church in America. I'm convinced of that. And I think that's a problem. But we also claim the promise. And notice the promise is singular. Sing, singular. Singular. Easy for you, me to say or you to say. It's singular. Why is it singular? Because we all receive the same promise. <laughs> The promise of salvation in Jesus Christ. And so, this is the time over these next 40 days to rend our hearts and to claim the promise that is ours. We must never forget that Lent does not end, that, that actually the church season, Lent may end on Good Friday and Holy Week or Holy Saturday, but the church season doesn't stop there. Because Lent always gives way to Easter. The promise is coming. And there are signs of the promise. And today from Genesis we have a sign. A sign that we know. It's perhaps one of the better known stories in the Bible of Noah and the ark. And the biblical story is actually one of a cycle of rending hearts, of the people rending hearts, and then God giving a promise. You know, when we start out in Genesis, one of the things that we have to notice is that the biblical story, in a sense, is a series of falls. You know, we think of the fall with Adam and Eve, and they ate what they shouldn't, and that's the fall, and God sends them out of the garden, and God... But, but, but there's, there's more than one of these things that happens. You know, you've got the fall, and then God, there's punishment, and Adam and Eve go out, and they begin to work, and God continues to work with people and promises. He makes promises to Adam and Eve. And then we get to Genesis, we get three or four more chapters in Genesis, and the world is wicked, and people, the last thing the people are doing and are rending their hearts, and God is, God is regretting uh, his creation, and so he decides, it's another, it seems like another fall, and so guess what he does? He has, sends the flood, and then the flood subsides, and in Noah and his family, he begins a new creation again. Let's start again. And then we get to chapter 11, and we get to the Tower of Babel, right? Where everybody wants to make a tower up to the heavens to storm the gates of heaven to take over. And God comes down and takes care of that plan. And then promises to start again in the call of Abraham. So it seems like we go through the Bible and there's this series of the people refusing, not only sinning, but refusing to rend their hearts. And then God has to do something about it, but then God always makes a promise after it. In other words, God never gives up. And so here we have the flood. Noah is, and his family are left. And at the end, God makes a promise by his way of a sign. He says to Noah and his family, I'm never going to do this again by flood. I will never destroy the world again by flood. And just so you know, there's going to be a sign. I'm putting my bow in the clouds. Now, rainbow, right? That, that's what it means, a rainbow. But the word here is bow. I'm going to put my bow in the clouds. What is it? It's a weapon. Right? Bow and arrow. It's a weapon. And God says, I'm putting my weapon up. <laughs> no more aggression. No more fighting with you. I want to be your protector. And so every time you see the rainbow, the bow up in the clouds, you will know that I've laid down my arms and that I want us to journey and travel together. And that's the sign. The sign is a sign of promise. God does this, God does this in other places. And in fact, it's interesting, for the next, the next two weeks in our Old Testament reading, we're going to read about continued covenants. You know, a covenant is an agreement, right? And in the Bible, 
There's more than one covenant. And what, the, what covenants are in the Bible is God stipulates the covenant. We don't get to negotiate that. God says, here's the covenant. I promise I'm going to keep it. You need to keep it too, and then we break it. So in one sense, the Bible is the story of God's covenant making and keeping on God's part and our covenant making and breaking on our part. But God makes a covenant. And when God puts the bow in the sky, when you see it, that's like God signing on the dotted line, right? I want to keep my, my agreement with you. But we struggle to do that, don't we? We struggle to keep the agreement. When we get next week and the week after that, there's going to be other covenants. So next week's the covenant with Abraham. The following week is the, the Ten Commandments and the covenant with Moses and the law, the giving of the law. And so God never gives up. We break things, we mess things up, and God comes right back ready to continue with us, ready to journey with us, And it's a sign. The bow is a sign. But you know, it's not just in the Old Testament. I think the other readings, scripture readings this morning, are very helpful in thinking about this. Because the baptism of Jesus is a sign. Water, baptism, flood, rainbow. The water of baptism is a sign. It's a sign that in Jesus Christ, God has made covenant with us. Jesus, in a sense, in his baptism is making covenant. He is saying to his people, I'm with you. My presence is with you. I will do what needs to be done to bring salvation to you. You know, we do that today in baptism when people are baptized, whether it's infants or adults. It's a sign. It's a sign not only of God's love and care and presence and covenant, but it's also our response to the covenant, that we too will be faithful. That's why you take vows when there's a baptism. That's why there's vows. It's a sign. And the letter of 1 Peter talks about Noah and connects it to baptism. It's an interesting passage. Peter tells us that between death and resurrection, Jesus went and preached to the spirits in prison who were there before the days of Noah and the flood. Wouldn't you like to know what he's talking about there? I got to tell you, so would I. That's another sermon for another time. But the point simply is what Peter sees, he sees a connection. He sees the ark. as a sign of the covenant as well, that the covenant protects. By the way, it isn't an accident that one of the early symbols that the church owned for itself was the image of a boat on rough waters. <laughs> and so the ark and the covenant of the rainbow is a reminder to, for Peter to the waters of baptism and the covenant that God has made with us in Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. Now in Jesus, God's covenant, this new covenant, is so sufficient, it is so complete that unlike the Old Testament, no other covenants are needed. This is the new covenant. It is the everlasting covenant. It is the covenant of all covenants. And God has promised to keep it, and God will keep it. Whether we're obedient or not, the only question for us is, do we want to be part of this covenant? Do we want to be part of the people of God? Because God will not coerce. God coerces no one. 
And so it's just a question of whether or not we would like to participate and allow the Spirit, notice the Spirit descends on Jesus. Remember, it's the Spirit that begins the act of creation. Are we willing to allow the spirit of creation and new creation to work within us? But in order for that to happen, we have to be willing to rend our hearts. I heard somebody once say, I can't think now of where I read it, but I got to tell you that because that's not me. You know, you got to give credit even if you can't remember who said it. But somebody once said that what God wants to do for us in Jesus Christ is not just a little redecorating. What God wants to do is renovate the entire house of our lives. And I like that. Because you know it's not necessarily a lot of work to paint a room, but tear down the drywall <laughs> and renovate. That's a lot of work, but guess what happens when you're, you're done? Boy, does it look good. <laughs> and so we rend our hearts in this time. And some of that may not be easy. Some of that may be facing difficult truths about ourselves that we don't want to face. But there's a reason why the church does Lent every year. It's because that we need to face these things. We never get to the place where we don't have to. So we rend our hearts, but we claim the promise. And how do we know we can claim the promise? How do we know God will keep God's promise in Jesus Christ? Well, because first, God speaks the truth. God will always do what God says God's going to do. But also, God gives us signs. And we have signs all throughout the biblical narrative. of signs of the promise, the rainbow, the waters of baptism, the cross of Jesus, and the empty tomb are all signs that God is going to keep God's promise. And I think God gives us signs today. I think we, we need to be careful because you know, we, don't wanna, we don't wanna see signs everywhere. I, not so sure we should be running after uh, images of Jesus on burnt toast, as some people do. But I think there's signs. I can remember many years ago talking to a woman who <clears throat> had told me that her father loved birds. He loved watching birds. That's what, he'd sit out and he'd just watch the birds. He loved watching the birds. He particularly loved cardinals. And one day, he had, and then he, he died, he had been gone for about a week, week and a half, and one morning she got up and she walked out to her one room, it was like a sunroom, and she pulled back the drapes, and here on the bird feeder, it was loaded with cardinals. And she said, I took that as a sign. <laughs> I took it as a sign that my dad was saying, I'm Okay. And it brought her great comfort. Friends, the church is a sign. The church is a sign to the world that in Jesus Christ, God wants to redeem all of it. We are God's sign of salvation. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for your love for us, for the signs that you give to us. We know that we are like the generations before. We can be fickle in our commitment. We certainly have our times of being faithful, but there are also times when we fall short. And we thank you for this season of Lent in which we can reflect upon the ways in which we have fallen short of the holiness that you expect from us. But we also, in this time, 
go into the season of Lent with great hope because we know that we have the transforming power of your Spirit. We know that you are with us. We know that in Jesus, you have promised to never leave us nor forsake us. And so in this day, in this time, in this season of Lent, in our worship, in our times of devotion, may you offer to us signs of your continued presence with us. And may we, your people, be a sign of your love for the world. In Jesus' name, amen.